Hello, everyone. Thank you for waiting. We're a little late. I apologize. Um, I am here with Genevieve. I've changed her name three times just in the past 15 minutes. <laughs> I keep trying to make her Quebecois and then realizing that she's not. Um, so I go between Genevieve, Genevieve. So I like sort of combine an English version and a French version. And then there's uh, Genevieve and then there's Jen. Um, and I think that we decided that the easiest thing would be to go with Jen. So I'm going to try for that. But you guys can imagine or, or say it to yourselves however you like. This is Emma's having a drink of water over here <laughs> in case you can hear slurping sounds. I got, oh, she's drinking my water. I didn't even know that. I have like my glass of water right here. And she's, I put out her own water too. I gave her her own little special glass of water specifically to avoid her drinking my water. But she goes she goes for mine because she knows or she thinks it's the freshest. Like she doesn't, she knows that whatever is usually in the Emma dish is not quite as fresh as whatever's in my cup. Okay, I've got to switch that glass out for a different glass. Anyway, okay, we're here with Jen and Mary Lou Singleton, as always. Um, and Jen, I can't get used to saying Jen either because I'm used to thinking you, of you as Jean-Viev. Um, and uh, Jean-Viev works for... <laughs> Redux. I'll stop doing this soon. I promise I'm the only one that's entertained by this. Um, she writes like some really amazing stories for Redux, which is like a really amazing and impressive publication. I actually can't even believe that Redux exists because of the amount of content and stories that you guys cover that nobody else covers. Um, and you're just, yeah, pumping it out and no holds barred. How long have you been with Redux? Um, just about two years now. So we officially launched in January 2022. Right. <laughs> Sorry, I have to. It's been um, it's been like a couple of years, but it feels somehow longer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, th that's because we're putting out stories every single day. And um, yeah, <laughs> that's not every day mm -hmm. is a lot. Um, how many, like, what's your, what's your team like? I'm curious. Well, like how many people uh, are there? So Anna Slats is the editor in chief and we co-founded it together. Um, at that time, it was pretty much more or less just the two of us, um, trying to take turns on <laughs> writing things every day, um, Jesus. checking each other and looking for things, et cetera. But now we have a, it's more established team of some other writers with us as well, like Shay Willihan. Um, uh, so we're kind of trying to expand the team more. And that's why we are we take donations, by the way. We take donations so we can pay the writers that we want to have on our team. Right. Is that kind of your main or only source of funding? Yes. Yes. Just right. donations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's how I managed Feminist Current for so long also was purely through donations. So uh, don't forget to donate to sites like Redux that are doing important independent journalism and putting out stories that no one else is covering, particularly on the uh, clown world that is transgenderism in our modern age. Um, and Jen is on Twitter at which I know you have two accounts, but I think the one that you're using the most is women read women. Is that right? Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's, I had set that one up because initially I'd started doing a podcast where I was reading feminist texts or doing interviews and stuff. Um, but since with Redux, I haven't been working on it quite as much. <laughs> so that's the reason for the, the handle women read women, because that was the project. But, uh, the other one I don't really use. I'd kind of set it up actually to keep people from impersonating me, but I don't really feel it like that's an issue anymore. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, and uh, for those who are just tuning in on YouTube, I would love it if you uh, liked the video and subscribed. Um, YouTube doesn't like me to be in the algorithm, so it does help to spread the word and support the channel if you like and subscribe these videos. Um, and 
Yeah, I actually, I, I haven't been putting my full interviews from the Same Drugs podcast on YouTube anymore because it just started to feel pointless. So the lives do a lot better because YouTube is less able to censor um, mm. when people are tuning in live. But when I, when I post my full interviews, they sort of just immediately demonetize them and push them out of the algorithm. So I put clips up and I, I put them up on Patreon and I put them on Substack. But I mean, all of these, these platforms are like so hard to function on if you're independent and if you're talking about things that you're not supposed to talk about, as we all know, including, of course, the gender identity issue, but, you know, other issues as well. Um, so, yes, please like and subscribe. And that ensures that you also don't miss notifications when we do these Where Are All the Women streams, um, which we're trying to do weekly now, which is awesome um, because we don't want to be disappeared. <laughs> so <laughs> Mary Lou, who is here every week also now, um, is... Uh, let me find her links for you. She is, of course, a midwife, a herbalist, a family nurse practitioner in New Mexico. Her substack is Mary Lou Singleton. Do subscribe. She covers awesome stuff and puts out really great articles. Um, Twitter is ML underscore Singleton. And her website is Enchanted Family Medicine. Mm -hmm. And your newest podcast is How I Healed, which is on substack also, correct? Yes, it's on substack. Okay, awesome. So we're coming here today to um, discuss women's bodies and women's bodies part, body parts and the objectification of women's bodies, which is sort of a term that I try to use as little as possible because I feel like objectification has become, unfortunately, one of those overused terms that reads as jargon and that people shut off when they hear or they just roll their eyes and are like, blah, 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 objectification. I don't know if people really know what it means all the time. It's most often used, I think, or it has been since you know, the early 80s, probably maybe the late 70s, in terms of things like pornography and the sexualization of women on film and in imagery. Um, but, you know, I, I think that it, it can be used in, in much more broad ways than that. Um, and of course, when you use it in the context of things like film and imagery and Instagram and pornography and all of that stuff, the, the most common response that you'll get usually from men is like, oh, we're not allowed to find women attractive anymore, <laughs> which is not really what it means. But I think, I mean, there was, I, I you know, there was a controversy. I was going to say, I was really glad that there was a controversy. I am sort of glad because it gives us the opportunity to talk about it. That broke out online around surrogacy this past week. Um, and I've been trying to cover surrogacy since like, 2014, I think, um, you know, there being feminists, radical feminists, you know, not the, not the third wave feminists, the other ones who have been really critical and fighting back really hard and fighting to create legislation um, against surrogacy um, and trying to explain to the world how harmful it is because surrogacy, like so many other issues that affect women, prostitution, pornography, objectification, um, it's mostly talked about in terms of choice. Um, and people say, you know, like it's a woman's choice and can't women, you know, do what they want with their bodies, which is a compelling argument in that argument's defense, because I do think that women should be able to do what they want with their bodies. Um, and it's often used in connection to the, you know, reproductive rights, abortion rights mantra, which is our body, our choice. Um, and so I definitely see how, how people would be, um, w w would, would relate things like surrogacy and of course things like prostitution, so-called sex work to abortion. You know, if we're gonna say our body, our choice, you know, like let women decide what to do with their bodies, then why not surrogacy? Why can't they choose to do pornography? Why can't they choose to sell sex? So I sort of want to talk about what's 
wrong with those ideas or where where the flaws in that arguments argument is and are sorry where the flaws in that argument are and um if you are watching on YouTube, I'm trying to keep an eye on the live chat. So please do pose questions in there if you have them or comments. Of course, I know that you guys are going to comment regardless. Um, I can't see everything in there. So if there is a burning question that you have that you definitely want me to see, please use the super chat. And uh, I'm not keeping an eye on comments on Twitter. If you're watching on Twitter, I'm sorry. So I won't be able to see any of your questions and comments there until after. But I think, you know, I think a big part of the reason why there was a controversy that broke out last week is because there was a story about two gay men who were having a baby via surrogate. And I think of late, the biggest push behind surrogacy, whether it's to legalize if you're in a place where it's not legal or to normalize or make it easier or more accessible or whatever, has been that it's been framed as a gay rights issue. So gay men who want to have families of their own, which I'm empathetic to, um, you know, just because I don't want a family of my own doesn't mean I don't understand that most other people do. Um, you know, like, and I, I do have sympathy for gay men and, you know, women who can't reproduce for whatever reason. Um, I think that would be a really hard thing to deal with and navigate. Um, but I also get really angry because, you know, this, this is harmful to women's bodies and it's harmful to babies and a baby isn't a thing to be bought. So it's like, you know, I don't want to be so harsh as to be like, well, too bad. You can't always have everything that you want. Um, but I do think, you know, a baby isn't a product that you're entitled to and a woman's body isn't a product that you're entitled to. Um, but in any case, I'm, I'm, I want to hear from from you too. I don't know if you, I think that you, uh, Jen, saw the that specific controversy that people were tweeting about all over the place and being, people were, were quite emotional about it, I would say. Um, I'm not sure if you did, Mary Lou. Was that the one where um, the male activists said, um, Sure, abortion's not murder, but uh, surrogacy is baby selling. Tell me how that makes sense. Was that? Oh, somebody your, did respond yeah. to me and say that. I mean, it's so it, it's that like what happened was this guy named Ben Zizloft, who um, I'd, I'd not heard of him before, but I guess he used to be with the Daily Wire. Um, it, you know, he's like a right wing guy, essentially. He's a right wing Christian guy. His profile says Jesus is Lord, husband, editor. Uh, Repub Sentinel, which I'm presuming is a Republican thing. Yeah. Um, and so he, what he tweeted was conservative commentator Guy Benson and his husband. So this guy, I, I think, is probably all actually anti-gay rights, um, have now rented a womb to acquire a baby, a move which Dave Rubin and his husband, <laughs> and yeah, I think he's questioning the legitimacies, legitimacy of this partnerships, um, made as well. This is a wicked and this is wicked and an abomination before God and should have absolutely no place in the conservative movement. Um, I think Guy Benson is like a Fox News host. Um, and so a lot of people responded to this Ben person with anger. So uh, one account that I follow, the rabbit hole tweeted, I assume the woman involved con consented to being surrogates. If so, what exactly is the issue here? Conservatives need to find better hills to die on so they stop losing. Um, someone else, A.G. Hamilton, tweeted, with no due respect, fuck off. Guy and his husband are going to be great parents and they don't need your permission to have a baby in the same way thousands of straight and gay couples do every year. He's also a far better advocate for conservatism than you could ever be. So, yeah, I mean, I like it, it's frustrating when these kinds of issues are, again, positioned as sort of like liberal versus mm -hmm. right. 
you know, that it, the same thing happens with transgenderism. The exact same thing for sure happens with prostitution and pornography. And it, and then it, it makes it really easy for people who support surrogacy or whatever it is that the so-called liberals are advocating because they can say, oh, this is only because you hate gays or this is only because you hate women. Um, this is only because of your religion. This is irrational. Um, and once again, the women are erased. Once again, the feminist analysis is completely erased from the conversation. And so I did try to respond to the, to the debate actually, um, which ended up... Um, you know, somehow being connected to abortion. Um, like this guy, Richard Hanania tweeted, let me try to understand the social po social con position on reproductive issues. Abortion should be banned so poor people can be forced to give birth. IVF and surrogacy should also be banned to prevent smart and successful people from reproducing. Do I have that right? And no. what I had responded was, I'm not conservative, so let's try this. You can't ban abortion. Women have been ending pregnancies since the dawn of time. It is their body. They may do with it what they wish. Surrogacy is an industry wherein the rich exploit poor women and it constitutes baby trafficking. You can ban buying and selling babies as well as buying and selling women, women's bodies. Um, which, I mean, that's the point where, where that guy, Mike Solana, who I quite like a lot, but I think his response to me was pretty rude, responded and said something like, um, let me get, get this straight. Uh, I wonder if I can find this response somewhere. You know, he basically said, like, abortion's murder, but, like, you're okay with surrogacy. Um, he said... He's in, yeah, implying... Oh, surrogacy. Oh, he said, oh, he's... Surrogacy is selling a child, but abortion isn't murder. Got it. <laughs> I was like, okay. Anyway, go on. Yeah, I think we can give a much better analysis than surrogacy is wicked and an abomination against God. I think that's, that's <laughs> not the best we can do. <laughs> And um, I think we can make a good argument against it. Um, to me, from my perspective, surrogacy and the anti-abortion argument are the same in that they both believe genetic gamete contribution is the only uh, the the only marker of who owns uh, our progeny, right? Like this, is how men can insert their gametes into us and come back nine months later and claim the infant. Now women have reached equality with that, right? That we can insert our gametes into another woman and it's our infant in there. Um, they both believe the baby is created at conception and belongs to the legal rightful owner and the woman's body is just an incubator for the process. Um, and that whoever has legal claim to the gametes that created the embryo is, is the rightful owner of the baby, not the woman who literally has made the baby. Like ba women aren't incubators. Babies are not, we've, we should have progressed past the, the, what was that called? The homunculus theory where the ancient Greeks and even through, through the middle ages, men believe that they ejaculated a very tiny, tiny, fully formed person into us. And then that just grew in us. We didn't do anything else. <laughs> Sorry, this is like a very cute image to me. That it's crazy, but like a little, the sperm is like, just like a little, little, little tiny baby. It's just a little baby. It's com it's a complete person. All the woman does is hang out while it grows. Versus... It's like one of those sponge dinosaurs. Like you, you get one of those little things in the mail and you put it in water and it turns into a big dinosaur. Yeah, ex yeah, very much like that. Yeah. And the woman doesn't do anything but sit there and eat, right? I mean, she's just a meat incubator for it. So both the far-right anti-abortion forces and the pro-surrogacy forces re do reduce women to incubators. And surrogacy is baby selling. It, I mean, it clearly is. Even for those who believe a baby begins at conception, it, we're selling, we're selling them. But um. Uh, I what I always argue for people is, OK, if, if surrogacy is legal, should a woman be allowed to buy sperm at a sperm bank, inseminate herself and then sell the baby on Craigslist? Why or why not? Mm -hmm. Like, how is that different? But the mm -hmm. difference is because the legal system is involved because the women are just commodities in the process. The difference is like the old conception of marriage, that a, a child was not legitimate unless there was a legal marriage or a religious marriage that legitimated a child. What legitimates surrogacy are the lawyers and the money, 
not, this is not women having control over their bodies. If we had control over our bodies, we could buy sperm and sell babies. So what do you say to the, the people who are many who say, well, if the woman consented, then why not? I think we need something like a Nordic model for surrogacy. And, but the thing is, when we even discuss that, it lays bare the horror of surrogacy and the fact it is child trafficking. I think, right. should it be legal to sell babies, but not legal to buy babies? I mean, it's, it's a funny thing because it's like, we're talking about ethics, you know, so it's not, it isn't a super black and white issue. It's an, it's an ethical question. And so we're talking about, the harm to women and the harm to babies, but also the harm of the idea. Um, and as always, people want to it, reduce it to an issue of consent and capitalism. You know, if they're consenting, it's fine. If they're getting paid, it's fine. We signed a contract. Mm -hmm. Well, it's also like, where do you draw the line then? Because you could say that um, victims of organ trafficking could possibly consent. Why not have that mm -hmm. be an industry? So I think that the problem here is that it's an industry. It's an exploitative industry. And I think that there's been a real lack of critical thinking and analysis about the ways in which industries exploit people, even as that exploitation is rapidly increasing, like we see with the transgender medical establishment and so on. There's just this huge push to commodify just about every aspect of our bodies that there is we're turning ourselves into these products and into these um, pieces and parts, like what you were saying with objectification earlier, because surrogacy reduces the woman to the, they even use the word gestator within mm -hmm. their own documents. They call women gestators, which is yeah. just astonishing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, within medicine, they've changed the diagnostic codes where, there's a separate diagnostic code for a, a pregnant woman who is not a surrogate. That's like the old pregnant woman code. And now there's a gestational carrier code. So she's even being objectified in that process of her, you know, she's a gestational carrier as her diagnosis. Right. I mean, and I think, I think it also completely misunderstands how babies are made. Like it seems to completely understand that the woman and baby are so completely connected, not just while the baby is growing inside her body, but then there's all these things that happen when the baby is born mm -hmm. that is, you know, inextricable from the baby's attachment and connection to, and, you know, physically being still, you know, attached to the woman's body that makes for a healthy baby and a healthy mom that I don't think people know about. I'm hoping that you guys can speak to that a bit as well. Well, in my opinion, I think that there's really only one class or group of people who benefits from surrogacy, and that's men, because it depresses the position of the mother while elevating the sperm donor as the le legitimate one. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is that throughout all of humanity, we always knew that a woman carrying a baby, it was her baby. That There's that maternity certainty that women have always had. Men lacking paternity certainty devised certain systems in order to be certain that their progeny was genetically linked to them via the woman. But through surrogacy, it removes that certainty of maternity and instead replaces it with the paternity, the, the DNA of the man being the legitimate. I mean, it, it's also like, <laughs> I started tweeting about surrogacy again recently because I've been watching Paris in Love mm -hmm. and I've, I find it so creepy in a variety of ways, not least in part because, you know, wealthy celebrities are always insane and completely detached from the real world and the the show is is like paris 
Paris Hilton, this is the Paris in question, is 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 creating this reality show, an attempt to show that her her new like loving family life. She finally got married to this guy who is a super weirdo in my opinion and seems sort of like robotic and also sort of like a father figure and is sort of like condescending and, and caring of her, but in a sort of fatherly condescending way. And he also comes from wealth and you know, her mother is this this horrible narcissist who makes everything about her. Um, but needless to say, Paris kept saying, you know, like, I want to start a family. You know, I've always wanted to have a family. I've always, you know, I want to have, have babies with you and, and we can start our family and have this new amazing like fairy tale life together, which, you know, I didn't, I didn't really buy that. I think that she felt like it was a thing she was supposed to say. And it was clearly a thing that he really, really wanted. He really wanted a family and he really wanted kids because she didn't really want to become a mother, you know, the, at the end of the day. So she's had I think she just had a second baby via surrogate, which we have not yet seen on the reality show. The reality show is looking at these two becoming parents by buying a baby, which they take, they drive to the hospital and then take the baby away. And then magically they're parents and magically she's a mother. Um, and, you know, just, just, just the, you know, she didn't want to go through a pregnancy. She didn't want to be pregnant. She didn't want to go through labor, which I understand and I can relate to. I also don't want to go through labor. That's why I don't have a baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's how that works. <laughs> and I think there's there's um, ancient wisdom within that. I mean, I I wanted to give birth so badly and was really good at it. I think I think not wanting to have children is um, is is an instinct as much as wanting to have children is for women. Mm. There's some women who just don't want to do it. And yeah, if a woman does not want to be pregnant and give birth, she's probably not going to be a great mother because she well, doesn't yeah. have a maternal instinct. And <laughs> if you don't, yeah, if you don't want it, you don't want to go, you don't want to get pregnant. You don't want to give birth. You don't want to have kids. Then yeah, I, I would also suggest not doing it. There's lots and lots and lots of women that do. I think there's plenty of women that will do that because they, they genuinely want to, um, and I think, yeah. you know, so what, what I guess part of my point is that I, I understand your point, Jen, around it being beneficial to, to men, but it also seems like it's beneficial to wealthy women. Well, certainly. Yeah. It's like, it's as though like a designer baby is a new status symbol mm -hmm. that you can, if you can afford to buy this and they are sometimes even designer babies. I mean, you can select your egg donor um, almost like from a menu based on certain physical characteristics, um, education. Obviously, the women who look like models and go to Ivy League schools are going to get the highest prices for their eggs. Um, and, you know, same thing with the surrogate, though, I suppose that matters to people a little less than the egg donor in that case, which, by the way, donor is the wrong word. There's so many examples of the wrong language being used here, mm -hmm. like sur surrogate. Surrogate is the person who's not the mother. So actually, the people who buy the baby would be the surrogate parents in mm -hmm. reality. And then donor is a tricky term that was deliberately used in order to disguise the fact that money is exchanging hands. She's not donating her eggs. They're being bought through right. a process that is quite um, intensive, actually. People don't seem to realize or think too deeply about the medical process behind egg, don egg donation. I, I, I mm -hmm. don't like that word, but that's what it is, I guess, egg harvesting. So mm -hmm. it often involves Lupron, which we may know from the puberty blocker debate, which is a right. cate mm -hmm. category X drug. It's a very powerful drug. And during egg harvesting, um, uh, the woman's body goes into hyperovulation. So typically a woman produces about one or two eggs per cycle, but during hyperovulation, it can be dozens, like up mm -hmm. to 30, 30 eggs. It causes tremendous strain on the body and can sometimes result in a condition that can be fatal which is called uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, OHSS. Um, so even within the egg harvesting, there is a risk of uh, 
possible death, although mm-hmm. again, we don't we don't have numbers on that because no one is counting them. No one is required to count these issues. Um, but there's also the problem that she may uh, develop uh, fertility issues in the future. So a woman who sells her eggs may possibly become infertile and incapable of having children herself in the future. And there's some anecdotal evidence that shows that possibly reproductive cancers yes. can be a, re- a result of this. And a woman who has done some work on that, Jennifer Lal. She's spoken with women who have actually been used within the surrogacy industry and goes over the the many issues that are involved with that. She had talked to a woman who uh, discovered to her shock that she had been participating in some kind of a baby trafficking organization, sending children to India. Um, but, but mostly Jennifer talks about the health issues that aren't being studied, which is really shocking to me that you would have Mm -hmm. an industry that is so profitable um, being spread out to other countries, by the way. It's starting to fan out um, outside of the U.S. I know U.S. is one of the rare uh, cases where the industry is is really thriving. Most countries have restrictions, but um, that you would have this industry that's worth what, how many billions, I don't know. And no follow-up research, no long-term follow-up research to say Mm -hmm. that this is safe. Because Mm -hmm. if you don't do the research, then you can say, well, we don't know if there are any problems, no risks. Well, and the risks we do know about are grave. As you said, the, you know, we know that this can be potentially life-threatening in the short term for women, potentially life-threatening in the long term, threatening to her fertility. Your own women can only do it up to 10 times because of the, the risks to their bodies. Um, so when people say women are paid so much more for, um, for the sale of their eggs than men are for the sale of sperm, men, um, you know, I, I mean, sperm are basically a waste product. Like men are leaving that stuff all over the place. Like it's, it's not, sperm it's not a it. valuable resource. Like no. men are like, <laughs> Men are but, like coming wherever every day in the shower and in Kleenex and wherever. Men <laughs> can can sell their sperm twice a week. Doesn't run out from age eighteen until age forty. Like they, their p- money making potential for selling their gametes actually is higher than it is for women. There's literally no risk to them. The um, every single sperm bank um is they're porn distributors. Like they, they put these men in porn filled rooms. So sperm selling sperm donation always involves a man jerking off to pornography, often violent pornography. Um, and okay. So, so the risk, the human egg is not supposed to exist outside the body. We're doing this completely artificial process to make women, as you said, produce more eggs than we're supposed to, and then retrieving them through a very painful process. The whole process is is painful, degrading, horrible. And we have no idea what happens to the children created from that process where these eggs have been showered Mm -hmm. in chemicals and pulled outside the human body. 100% of these kids are created through IVF, which is a super creepy experiment on on humanity itself, um, where they wash the outer layer off the egg, the the intelligent membrane of the egg called the zona pellucida will not allow herself to be violated. So they they take the head of the sperm off and put it in a micropipette and they shove it in the egg. And the egg won't allow that to happen. She'll explode. So they acid wash the zona pellucida off, the intelligent layer that decides what sperm can come into the egg. And they rape the egg. They shove the micropipette into the egg and put the sperm head in there. And then they they create a little blastocyst. You know, they start growing this embryo that's grown outside of the human body that's not supposed to happen outside the human body. And now between... um, when they get to a couple days old, between eight and 64 cells, they pluck a cell from it and do genetic experimentation, to uh, genetic testing to see if this embryo has any genetic diseases. We have no idea what that does to be missing an eighth to a 64th percent, uh, 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 you know, of, of your original mass. Um, And then when they decide it's a good embryo, they then, after they've filled a surrogate with chemicals to ripen her womb, they put it in her. 
even if people don't care about women, why are they doing this to children? What is this doing to the children that are being created? What we know so far is children created through IVF are exponentially more likely to have cancers of all kinds. Um, they, their, um, have their rate of neuroblastoma, which is a very deadly childhood cancer, um, is, is incredibly high. They're more likely to be autistic. They are more likely to have central nervous system disorders. They're more likely to have cardiac disorders. They're more likely to have circulatory system disorders. This is an uncontrolled experiment on humanity that is creating messed up humans. And, and if I may, the, the man who created IVF was a member of the British Eugenics Society, Robert Edwards. So there, there's that link uh, every single time, you know, IVF, mm -hmm. uh, eugenics, surrogacy, mm -hmm. eugenics. So, yeah. And this, the myth that people are getting a better genetic baby than if people who like the way they both smell and look, meet each other on the dance floor and make a baby, like that's, that's a millennia old intelligent process in the body of that's how, how we're yeah. supposed to find each other and made that all that natural intelligence is coming out. But because we live in our minds, um, we think we're making superior people. And in reality, we're making people who have a lot of problems. Right. I mean, it seems like a, a really unhealthy way to make a baby. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, I just think about you know, when I was watching, I feel dumb that I keep referencing Paris in Love, but I actually think that it's a, a very good thing to watch if you want to freak people out because I think you can see how creepy and, and inhumane the whole process is in that it's so, like, detached from humanity, from, like, the mother's humanity, from the baby's humanity. Like, you go take this baby, this brand new newborn baby, this tiny little baby that just came out of its, its mom and you take it away from the mom and you give it to these random strangers who have no connection or attachment to this baby and they take it home and because they're wealthy, they then hand it off to the nanny. Like it's horrific, like undoubtedly, like I'll bet a million dollars this kid's going to be so fucked up. Um, I mean, probably for a variety of reasons, but including that one, I mean, like, so I want people to understand too what happens when the baby is born and why it's so important for the baby to be with its actual mother, not the the mother that, that bought it. Um, did you happen to see, there's, there's a woman who was uh, born through surrogacy, who is now speaking up against it. And I'm sorry, but her name escapes me just now. I just saw her on, uh, on X like a week or two ago where she was giving a speech about this. And she mm. was talking about this very thing, the mother, uh, the mother child bond and how she experienced that and how it disrupted her life. Uh, she talked about having trauma all of her life and not fully understanding what the problem was and why she had so many trust issues and she had to be in therapy and she was just always afraid and insecure. And she's saying that the reason that she believes that was the case is because of the, the mother child bond being broken at such a young age through surrogacy. Absolutely. We, we just had just started talking about that with our critiques of the baby scoop era and the, and the gaslighting of adoptees, right? That, that we finally started having a lot of, voices of adoptees being heard and, and the mental health industry addressing attachment theory and the importance of maternal child attachment and how every adopted child starts off with, with a grief and, and essentially every adopted child has some degree of a disordered attachment. And now, now everyone's pretending that it's not a big deal to have all of this disconnection and no attachment with surrogacy. I mean, the women who, who, act as surrogates, you know, women who are gestating babies that are going to give to someone else, they're, they're not, that's not a mentally healthy pregnant state to be completely disconnected from the baby that you're, you're creating. Um, as you said, Megan, that they, a newborn baby is attached, literally attached to its mother. The baby just wants to be on the mother. The baby isn't thinking whose, whose egg did I come from? The baby knows who, his or her mother is and wants to be on the, on the baby, on the mother's body, wants to be nursing 
Now surrogates are encouraged to pump their milk and sell that as well. Um, they're saying, you know, you can feed your, I mean, that the milk selling industry is also booming. Well, interesting you bring that up because uh, I had written for you, Megan, about this, I think a couple of years back mm -hmm. in New York State, Senator Brad Hoyleman, he snuck in um, a rider for commercial surrogacy to be legalized in the state of New York during the COVID uh, pandemic, and he attached it to financial aid for COVID. So just kind of shoved it in there. Um, but he also advocates for creating a breast milk industry. Well, that that makes sense, right? Especially, and you know, maybe sorry to bring this point up because it's so contentious, but gay men, especially would be the ones who would most benefit from something like this uh, milk industry, surrogacy plus milk industry, um, mm -hmm. having no female in the relationship, of course, I mean by that. I mean, this is the thing, right? Is that when you talk about that reality, then it's framed as being anti-gay, anti-gay men, anti-gay rights. And it makes me really angry because, it, yeah, it just seems so entitled to me. Like it's like, you know, you just because you're you're a gay man and so you've been marginalized in this particular way through past homophobia and um, being discriminated against in the past, which get, I would argue that gay men no longer are in North America. Um, and, you know, so now you're, you're doing really well and you have money and then you're you're entitled to you feel that you're entitled to a baby and to use a woman's body and when you take offense it's because according to you it's you know you, you must be homophobic if you're not going to allow gay men to have families just like everyone else and i just want to point out to another reason that I do bring up the issue of gay men in particular is because there is an organization that is lobbying other countries internationally to create surrogacy industries. So it's called Men Having Babies. It's the founder is Ron Paul Dian. Um, he he had a baby with his sister. Uh, like what? I think, yeah, he got her egg, his sister's egg, and his sperm. Um, really. So, uh, Yes, really. <laughs> and he the, put, that he took her egg and his sperm and then put it in another woman's body. Yes. Huh. Yes. And he <sighs> his or, his organization hosts conferences in other countries. I think they were just last month in Belgium lobbying the government there. Um, but they've been to, for example, Taiwan. So in, around 2018 or 2019, somewhere around that time when Taiwan uh, legalized uh, same-sex marriage, men having babies just immediately went into Taiwan to start advocating for surrogacy. Well, you know, I do want to continue talking about surrogacy because it's so abominable, but I think we should fast forward to I really think 10 years from now, we're going to feel this conversation is quaint because there are very wealthy gay men pouring tons of money into artificial womb technology. They are pouring tons of money into womb transplantation experiments. Um, and Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI, very wealthy, influential guy, um, and his two ex-boyfriends, Matt Krisiloff and who's the other guy? Um, uh, Lucas Harrington, they have started a company called Conception Biosciences, where they are hard at work making, trying to make egg cells out of male blood cells. And this has already been done in Japan with mice. So they have achieved this in mammals already. Another gay researcher in Japan who created um, both sperm and egg cells from male mouse hair follicles and then created a mouse embryo, put it inside a female mouse the mouse gave birth, but the mouse just did and gave birth, but it was announced of they've created scientists have created mice with no mother. Um, and then those babies have gone on to reproduce for several generations. So they're saying that that proves it's going to be safe in humans. Oh my God. I mean, the, the brave new world connection here seems very real. And Jen just sent me, this story that I, I haven't had a chance to look through very cl closely, but it's quite amazing. 
Um, and she tweeted about it. You tweeted about it, sorry, <laughs> like a month ago. So I'm just going to read what you wrote here, and then you can talk a bit more about this. So trans-identified male Petra de Sutter, Paul, who has been the deputy prime minister of Belgium since 2020 and was form formerly a member of the European Parliament, gave a TEDx talk in Brussels in 2018 praising Brave New World, the book, as a vision of a future to aspire to, which I could not believe because I cannot imagine reading that book and not being totally creeped out, like totally creeped out. Um, in the talk, I started reading it again recently, actually. I'm about halfway through because I haven't read it since high school or like I feel like we read it in grade 12 in high school. It may have been early college, but I'm pretty sure that was a later high school read. Um, so I've been rereading it. Um, uh, in the talk, which he titled Telebabies, <laughs> Dr. Dr. DeSutter, a former gynecologist, um, praises gene editing as a moral imperative and quotes Julian Sabulescu, who has co-authored an academic paper on why eugenic selection is preferable to enhancement. Um, in the world of Aldous Huxley, procreation is not something that is connected with sexuality or with relationship or family building anymore. You just go to a clinic or a factory, if you wish, and you give your gametes. After so many months, you can pick up your child, which has been genetically enhanced and designed according to the features that you want. DeSutter has previously been accused of a conflict of interest when campaigning to alter laws to permit surrogacy, the surrogacy industry in Europe. He has openly profited from surrogacy practices in the hospital where he worked as a gynecologist, University Hospital of Ghent, and co-developed a surrogacy clinic in India called Seeds of Innocence. Seeds of Innocence. <laughs> Ooh, that's the Orwellian part. Yeah, as you're reading that, Megan, it's just, it's like, dystopia after dystopia, right? The fact that he's a gynecologist, the yeah. fact that he's the deputy prime minister of Belgium, you know, all of these insane things in just one story, but you really should watch the TED talk. It's, it's mind blowing. He references Brave New World as, as aspirational. He talks about, um, what's the name of that film that Ethan Hawke, Gattaca, Gattaca. I think it was. He talks about that again in a very positive way. Um, so it's just open eugenics, but it's being rebranded as sort of improving on the human genome. And this is already happening. There was a doctor in China a few years back who had his medical license taken away for, for gene editing. Well, surrogacy allows for a living laboratory in order to experiment on the human genome. And like you had pointed out, Mary Lou, and so he was, you know, shut down, but it's going on in Ukraine, or it has mm -hmm. been going on in Ukraine anyway, um, where they were taking mitochondrial DNA um, in an attempt to have two fathers, right? So it would be two, two fathers and then the woman's DNA. So it would be like a three parent baby it was what they were trying to make. But the problem with mitochondrial DNA is that it's inheritable. So any of these uh, genetic alterations would be passed down, but only through the female, which is pretty frightening if you think about it in the long term. Like at the moment, they're trying to focus on things like we're going to prevent um, HIV, you know, things that sound very uh, noble. But we see how this technology keeps running further and further away from anything noble. I mean, <laughs> that's the thing with IVF, right? That's what they tried to say is that we're helping infertile women. We're helping right. you. But it's just gone completely exploitative, you know. Well, for one thing, they don't put any research into actually curing and treating infertility. There's not, there's no money going. I mean, there's a small amount mm. like through Catholic organizations, but there's basically no industry around helping women uh, reclaim their fertility within their own bodies and not being dependent on industry to make children. Or right? looking at why they're becoming infertile. Yeah. And 
And as we've been saying, a lot of people accessing surrogacy aren't even infertile. They're just, they're buying babies. They don't want to be pregnant if they're female or they're gay men um, or they're just men. I mean, they're single men buying babies as well. There's no regulation. I have a lot of critiques of, of the adoption market as well, but at least there are legalities and screenings in place that you have to jump through hoops to prove to the state that you're a fit parent. Anyone can buy a baby through surrogacy. You just have to have the money and anyone can buy mm. many. During the Ukraine, the beginning of the Ukraine war, there were so many stories about these surrogacy factories. And there was one that um, there were 40 pregnant women all commissioned by the same man at the same time. Oh my God. Right. But like, and that's, that's for happened. what? Like where are the babies That's the question. Go? Where are they going to go? What's he doing? Uh -huh. um, no, there's no, there is, there's absolutely no regulation of who can access this. And people will say, well, you know, you don't want the state giving licenses for parenting and should people be allowed to just have sex and have babies. But this is a really big difference between the surrogacy industry and the adoption industry. And so anyone can buy a baby. So what I, I want to talk a little bit more about adoption because that is, you know, you know, when people say, well, what are, what are people, what are women who are infertile supposed to do? What are gay men supposed to do? And people suggest adoption. I mean, that that's sort of controversial sometimes. Megan Wisdom in the live chat said, um, I've thought about fostering or adopting since I wasn't able to conceive. So I would love to hear your thoughts on the ethic ethics of those options. Thank you. Um, you know, because it does, I mean, to me, fostering especially does seem like a very ethical thing to do because the foster care system is so awful and it just destroys kids' lives. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, the best hope that those kids have is to be adopted by a, a good family, by good parents, by a good parent. Um, it's just, it screws people up so badly boys but you know girl often the girls will end up in prostitution and stuff like mm -hmm. that because they're but you know and I don't I don't know much about the adoption process or the adoption system and how that works I, I think it is quite expensive to adopt but I don't know where the money goes well the money doesn't go to the women the, the money goes to lawyers and the agency mm -hmm. and the whole industry set up around it it's it's actually illegal to pay the woman you can pay her living expenses through the pregnancy and for a few months afterwards, you can pay her medical expenses, you can um, help her buy clothes, but it's it's literally illegal to pay her. So all of these tens of thousands of dollars per adoption, sometimes more than that, are going to lawyers, to social workers, to adoption agencies. And it's in, an, in another industry, like you were saying, Genevieve, anytime there's an industry, there's exploitation. It, it appears that to, to be the case, especially when it comes to human reproduction. Um, unfortunately, there are tragedies where children sometimes um, cannot be raised by their mothers. So adoption is going to exist. <laughs> it's existed throughout history. It exists across species. There are, um, in, you know, we know there are documented incidences of, of, mothers dying um, in the animal world and the baby being adopted by even another member of a different species. So adoption happens, but there's also a lot of pressure on poor women who are pregnant, who go seeking services to place their children for adoption. And that was especially prevalent before the legalization of abortion. There was an enormous exploitation of, of pregnant single mothers. Um, there's a feminist organization called Saving Our Sisters that works to keep mother baby unit, the mother baby intact and to help women to, so they don't feel like they have to place their babies for adoption. They did a huge um, survey of women who had placed their children for adoption, most of whom don't have good mental health outcomes after doing that. And they asked them, what would made a difference? What would you have needed to keep your baby? The most common answer was money. And guess how mm. much money? $1,200 that like $1,200 would have been enough to make this desperate woman feel like she had enough money to parent her own child, to mother her own child. And all that money going to lawyers, to agencies, to everybody, but the woman um, could be used to keep mothers and babies together, which is the foundational relationship of humanity. You know, mm -hmm. women create humanity. Women are the transmitters of culture. 
women are are the the caregivers of young of our own young children um and you're breaking that bond and selling babies to generally people with enough resources to pay for them so it unfortunately still has a lot of baby selling aspects to it I think that a lot of this has to do with, I hate making sweeping generalizations about men, um, but I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I think men don't really understand women's bodies. They don't understand pregnancy. They don't understand that mother-baby bond. Because, I mean, not necessarily because they're bad people, but because they can't relate because they don't have women's bodies and mm -hmm. they don't grow a baby inside them and they don't give birth to it and they don't understand what that, how different that bond is from the bond that even they might have with their child. Um, and, and I think that connects to abortion too, actually, because men who are opposed to abortion just think of the baby as separate from the mother again. So, you know, they'll argue that like, you know, they'll argue in defense of the baby's right and the fetus's right to exist. And, you know, the mother doesn't have the right to murder that baby. Um, and, you know, what if it's my baby? Don't I have a right over that baby? It's my sperm. Um, and, and, and don't seem to get that, like, from my perspective anyway, as long as the baby is inside the woman's body and completely dependent on her for its ability to you know become a full-fledged baby and to be born and to exist and, and survive it, it is it is still her body and it can't be disattached from her body and if we're going to advocate for women's bodily autonomy and not for her body to be controlled by the state for example then we do have to support her right to choose even if you don't like that choice i mean i can i get it i can totally understand why a person wouldn't like the idea of abortion. But at the end of the day, if the choice is, you know, the state gets to decide what a woman does with her body um, or a man or whoever it is, anybody other than her, then I'm sorry, but that's draconian and it's unethical. And you can think it's also unethical to kill the baby or the fetus or however you want to frame it. I'm not going to, I'm not the kind of person who's going to say that it isn't a life because clearly it is a life, but you do, you do have to make a, a choice around that. I think. I think often it's my impression that, that there are men who are opposed to abortion because they assume that if it, if they were in that position, they might act a certain way. By that, I mean that if abortion is legal, women will just go around having sex all the time with anybody and getting tons of abortions. Yeah, just men act like it's like a joyful thing and women are like such like sociopaths or they're so out of control sexually or out of control in general that they're they're like, well, now she can just go fuck whoever she wants and just go have an abortion like that as if like, there's a ton of women who are doing that. I don't know any woman who's done that at all. And I know a lot of women <laughs> I've spent my whole career talking to and interviewing women from all around the world. Never mind, you know, the women that I know and I'm friends with in my real life. And, you know, I'm sure a, a number of them have had an abortion once. Most of them, I don't even think that, to be honest. But, like, I don't know anybody who's used abortion as birth control. But and it, abortion is birth control. Yeah. I mean, you could use it as birth control. Like, I, I know plenty of women who've had abortions because they don't want to be tied to an abusive man for the next 18 years. Exactly. Uh, I, that's an incredibly common reason women have abortions. And you are. And you would be tied to an abusive man and your kid would be tied to an abusive mm -hmm. man and you'd both be abused for your whole lives. Like, mm -hmm. you, you would be there. Like... Yeah, torturing you through the court system, um, absolutely having, you know, just control over your life. I, I think that that's one of the most common reasons women have abortions is not wanting to be tied to to the person they had sex with that, that you know, that helped with the conception of the pregnancy. 
That's why I almost had an abortion. I didn't have an abortion because I miscarried before the abortion. And I really, really did not want to have an abortion. I really wanted to keep the little life that I had created inside me, despite the fact that never in my life had I ever wanted a child before. But of course, you know, like I was pregnant and I was just like, wow, this is like a miracle. And I didn't, I did, I really, really just didn't want to go through the process of having an abortion. And, but I knew I, that I had to because this guy, was abusive and awful and I hadn't intended to get pregnant with him at all of course and I'm not going to explain the circumstances of what happened but it's not a choice to try to get pregnant that's for sure and he's the kind of guy as you know most if not all abusive men are you know he had he is a lot older than me he had a lot of money I had zero money I was you know literally living in a trailer um on a little island you know I didn't have a vehicle I didn't have a career I didn't have my education I was not in any position to be having a baby and this guy would have dragged me through hell for the rest of my life and the kid and so I you know I had to I felt that I had no choice and luckily in my mind again probably seems like a weird thing to say to some people I miscarried um I think I willed that to happen um, I did at the time and I still do now. Um, but I mean, I, it's, it's just so, it's such an upsetting conversation for me that, um, it, it distresses me that we live in a world where ejaculation is considered the same contribution to making a baby as making the baby. You know, this is just so distressing that, um, you know, we, babies are made through women's blood and sweat and tears, and and it's a life threatening process to to go through a pregnancy and give birth. And I say this as a midwife and as someone like, I loved giving birth; it was a peak experience for me, and it it changed my body in ways that many women would not want their bodies to be changed in those ways. Um, it you know, it's harrowing every time. It's like you walk through a river of your own blood to bring a person here. It's a big thing to have a baby. And it's, it's life-threatening every time. And then you are this person's mother. There is an enormous biochemical reality that you are now bonded to this baby. This baby is, it can, you know, the, the metaphor that sounds so cliche, but is so true that having a child is like having a piece of your heart walking around outside of your body for the rest of your life. Like these people are part of you forever. So when a woman decides to end a pregnancy, she is one deciding she doesn't want to, um, to risk her life and her health to, to continue making this person. Um, cause I hate the adoption, not abortion argument where it just completely negates the, the severity of the health risk of, of being pregnant and giving birth. Um, not to mention what it does to your life and not to mention what it's going to do to your mental health. And then she's also aborting motherhood, literally. Like it's, she's deciding, I don't want to become a mother. I don't want to go through this process where I will um, make a baby that I'm bonded to and that I'm going to be mothering for the next 18 years. It has, it's, it's such a different thing than, than I'm just, you know, whimsically getting pregnant and, and aborting for the fun of it. It's, it's a huge decision. And to me, absolutely human life begins at fertilization we have to we have to acknowledge that biologically i don't care when the embryo becomes a person i know the woman is a person and the state cannot force a person to be an unwilling life support system for another person period and that is the really dehumanizing aspect of this argument when when men don't realize what they're saying is you're no longer a human with rights you are a state regulated incubator and, and on that note, Mary Lou, uh, the inherent risk involved in childbirth also takes us back to surrogacy because people like to forget that women still die in childbirth and especially in the United States, which has, I think, perhaps the highest, if not one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the industrialized world. We have so, the highest, yeah. Women today are more likely to die in childbirth than, than they were 25 years ago in the United States. Wow. That's right. Crazy. So these wealthy people, often gay men are, well, these wealthy women like Paris Hilton are down, like they are 
farming out their risk, right? They, they're hiring yeah. a woman to <clears throat> risk her life to make a baby. Right. I mean, the Kardashians have done this also. I think Kim, I think Kim had two via surrogacy and Chloe had one via surrogacy and her sort of excuse was that it was determined that it would be risky for her <laughs> to do it herself. So she pays someone else to do it. And then of course, you know, she's distraught and depressed and confused at why she's not bonding with the baby. And, you know, she did this whole really disturbing, in my opinion, photo shoot at the hospital where she comes to the hospital to collect her baby. Always the surrogate is out of the picture and they say to protect her privacy, but it's just because that would probably be even more disturbing to see the mother and the newborn baby being taken from the mother and probably how distraught both baby and mother are. Um, and so Chloe has this brand newborn baby that she's taken from the mother and she's doing this photo shoot you know, in full makeup, looking, you know, perfect as you would not look as if you'd just given birth, if you'd just become a mother, um, in the hospital bed holding the baby. And it's just, it's, it's so like they're, I think what they're trying to do is have this fantasy that they did it themselves in the hopes that they'll feel comfortable with it. Or, you know, maybe that the, the baby will be confused and forget who his real or her real mother is. Um, and have you seen there's um, there's an insurance uh, industry that's springing up around um, life insurance for surrogates, which means in the hmm. case of death, the intent. So if if the woman dies in the process at any point, not just in childbirth then the intended parents in one contract that I saw, the, the buyers would then be given $100,000 if she died, but only to be spent on another attempt at surrogacy. So it's saying, oh, well, she died. Here's your payout. Let's try again. Uh -uh. It's it's all so distressing and so dehumanizing. It's, um, it's and I mean really the funny. other thing, which like I'm sure both of you have made the connection between, is that it's you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm trying not to harp on men here because I know that's uh, distasteful to men listening, and it's probably some women listening. But um, you know the the idea of transgenderism literally objectifies women's bodies. Mm -hmm. So it says that a man can become a woman by attaching, you know, these body parts that look like women's body parts. I mean, they don't, in my opinion, like fake breasts. You can pretty much always tell when a woman has fake breasts. I think they look retarded. <laughs> I think fake breasts are not sexy. And I know men who've said the same thing because obviously they don't feel like breasts. Um, but nonetheless, you know, attaching these body parts, this is what makes me a woman. I've attached these things that look sort of like breasts. They don't function in any way like breasts do in any way, which it doesn't seem to occur to these men that a breast isn't just silicone glued to your chest. And then they create holes in their body that can be penetrated that are not vaginas in any way at all. And this is what makes a woman. A woman mm -hmm. is just these parts. Maybe if we can stick a, a uterus inside a man's body, then he's a woman. He can get pregnant. He has a woman's body part inside him. He, he is what yeah. makes him not a woman. So much money is being poured into uterine transplantation right now. Um, again, they're exploiting this group of women. It's a very small subset of women who are born with a genetic condition where they don't have a female reproductive tract. And... Um, all the research being done on the small group of women who are, um, you know, they're given all this free care to be experimented on, whether they have done many, many uterus transplants into women with this genetic defect. And now we have babies that have been born from the transplanted uterus. Again, an experiment on humanity. We don't know what those anti-rejection drugs are going to do to the babies that are created. We don't, we have no idea what the long-term outcomes are going to be on the humans that are being created here. But all that research is being poured in, is being used to get to the golden 
ticket that they want, which is putting the, the uterus in the man. Mm. And you read the scientific journals on it, and these researchers and doctors make statements like that we know, like they're, you know, transgender transgender women are no different than women born without a uterus and a vagina. They're the same. Mm -hmm. So we can just do the same technology on them. Right. They say when you say men can't give birth, only women can give birth, then they say, well, then you're saying that women who can't give birth or who are infertile or, you know, have had hysterectomies aren't women because that's what they think because they think it's just a body part. Right, right. You don't have a uterus. You're not. You're, what's the difference between me and you? Mm. And then we have all of these autogynephilic men who are inducing lactation and putting babies to their breasts as a fetish, and it's, it's being celebrated by La Leche League. It's being celebrated by many third wave feminists um, as oh, isn't that wonderful that these trans women can can experience the female experience of breastfeeding and again, no consideration of what it's doing to the child, no consideration of the health risks of whatever drug-induced secretions are coming out of that man's mm. mammary tissue are doing what to that it? child. What is it? What's coming out? S some kind of secretions that are coming from his breasts. It's, there, there was, but how uh, did they make that happen? They like say it's, it's just milk? through hormones and then his, but of course well, it's not milk. Men with or, endocrine problems sometimes lactate. It's considered a, a big problem. It's often a sign oh, of a really? brain tumor okay. or, or some other horrible. Is it lactation? Like, is it the same as what comes out of a woman's breast, though? They say it is. I don't think we have honest evidence about that. It's clearly not the same as what a mother who made the baby, who's been in constant biochemical communication with the baby since conception is making specifically for her baby. Like human breast milk is miraculous stuff. There's all these research um, studies that uh, women with twins will make different milk for the different children because the smell of the child is different and it, it um, the baby is needs different and the mother is, is making different food for the baby based on that individual's baby's needs. And she'll have a baby on one breast and a baby on the other. And the consistency of the milk is different depending on what the each baby is hmm. chemically stimulating her with, with the baby's pheromones, with the, all the other, I hate to be so reductionist, but just all of the other um, ineffable communication systems that are going on between the mother and the child. What do so, you know about this, Jen? The men um, who, are, I was, who are lactating. More than I would like to. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's awful. I mean, it's it's a sexual fetish, you know? I mean, so if when you're having a child as a, as a prop in some kind of sexual fetish, that's clearly child sexual abuse. There's nothing good about it. And I can't understand why this isn't, glaringly obvious to people that it's a fetish um why anyone would celebrate this I, but I, I i was also thinking too about um ectogenesis right so if mm -hmm. the uterine transplants they're not going to be successful um i can't imagine how they could be because men don't have birthing hips etc cetera, etc cetera. but if they're not successful, there uh, are also these experiments going on with something called the bio bag, mm -hmm. uh, which is being made by CHOP, the, uh, sh what is it again, Mary Lou, do you remember? It's Children's George Hospital Marsh. of Philadelphia or no, is yeah. that, yeah. I think so. It's one mm -hmm. of the leading hospitals around um, transgender um mm -hmm protocols, medications, et cetera. Right. They're affiliated with Penn. That they're doing tons of the uterine transplant research there. Right. So the bio bag. So bio bag, which uh, is horrific. Uh, it's got this sort of cute name, bio bag. But when you when you actually look at, I, there's a video you can see, which I, I don't strong, strongly recommend. They're using a baby lamb and they've got this baby lamb in a plastic bag to, to, to gestate. Um, and it's in there for the full term. So they, they put the embryo in this bag and then kind of like grow it within this. It, it, it looked, I think it's vinyl. I think it's plastic. Mm -hmm. 
um, and they're pumping what they claim is like amniotic fluid into it. And then the, the lamb grows up. But, um, you know, after they did this successfully, the very first thing they did to that poor lamb, they killed it. <laughs> so they could cut it open and check if it was okay. Yeah. And so <laughs> it's, this it, is, yeah. you know, and then they said it was okay. It was okay. <laughs> uh. Uh, it's horrible. It, it, you know, the, it, people can talk about the ethics around animal experimentation and people have different mm -hmm. opinions about that. But when we're talking about research that really does not need to be done, there, there, this is just pure um, experimentation um, for profit. And there's really no feasible medical reason for this kind of research. So I think it's an excess of, of kind of sadism, actually, or, or greed or, yeah. They sold it as it's it's going to help save premature infants. Right. That's how it was being sold. But this, you know, I'm a midwife. I had my kids at home. I'm really into birth. I think it's well designed. I think it works well on its own. I think it works worse when we interfere with it. So that being my preface, none of this would be happening without the industrialization of birth that happened in, in the post-war period, you know, from 1945 to 1960 all birth in the United States and most industrialized countries moved into the hospital. And that's where we came up with this idea that hospitals deliver babies. And that's what eventually leads the, mm -hmm. the, the, the Kardashian sister in the hospital bed with her purchased baby, right? That's where you buy a baby. Women are so removed from the birth process with industrial birth. Um, first we were anesthetized and had our babies cut pulled out with forceps that, that was normal birth from like 1950 until the mid seventies. Um, then there was a co-optation of the natural birth movement that instead of clamoring to get our female sisters back and our mothers back and reclaim female birth culture, women asked for men to be involved in the birth space, right? Like it's like, oh, let the men in here. So men started feeling like they had a right to be at births and it was just as much about them as it was about women, which it kind of was because all the women are unconscious and, then we move to the gaslighting of, of you no longer under general anesthesia. You're just numb from the waist down. So you're awake, right? So we're completely separate from the process. Everyone's getting synthetic oxytocin. So the, the bonding's not happening to the same degree. Um, the cesarean rate is through the roof. So when you say men don't mm. have a birthing hips and a birth canal, we've already normalized cesarean as um, there, you know, in Boston, more than 50% of babies are being born by cesarean in Brazil. It's close to a hundred percent and in many places. What? And, yeah. It I was, was going to oh, bring that up. Uh, yeah. Also the, the, the fact that so many women are having births via cesarean section right. and, and how that impacts her and the baby, because I think that that those rates to me, it seems obvious that this is just to benefit the hospitals and the doctors because they can make more money that way. They can get the women in and out. They can do a lot less work. It's simpler for them. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, if we factor out, um, there are births that are safer in the hospital for sure. It's probably about 10 to 15% of births that statistically are going to be safer in the hospital, but we have terrible birth outcomes. If you talk to any given woman, if you do a survey of 100 women who started out their prenatal care in that industrial model and birthed in that industrial model, I guarantee over 90 of those 100 women are going to tell you that they truly believe they or their baby would have died if they hadn't been there because it's set up to make women feel like failures. It is set up to make women believe hospitals deliver babies. We see this in the vernacular of women describe their entry into motherhood as when I brought you home from the hospital, which is not how a home birth mother describes her entry into motherhood. Her entry into motherhood is when I birthed you, my own power under my own volition, into my own hands, onto my own body. So none of this could be happening without that setting the, the groundwork for birth as an industrial process and getting women to believe that and getting all of humanity to start believing that. Sorry, I was muted. Um, i I did want to I did want to get to some of the comments and questions in the in the chat before we log off, which we can do soon because it's been you know an hour and twenty minutes. I don't want to keep you both super late. Although Jenna's just told me that she's nocturnal just like me, and I was so excited. Um, 
to be validated in that way. Um, you know, she also said that she works late into the night and goes to bed at 3 a.m. So she's up, it was 10 a.m., which is early for her. And I was like, yeah, I know. Yeah. I work until 1 or 2 a.m. And then I'm watching Paris in Love until 3 or 4 a.m. And I need my eight hours. So I sleep <laughs> till noon. People think it's lazy, but I'm just getting in my eight hours. Um, but uh, Lance in, in the in the chat says, Megan says surrogacy is bad for women and babies. How isn't it perfectly obvious that you might just as accurately describe be describing abortion? Should abortion be illegal because it's sometimes harmful? And I mean, I would argue, first of all, that you can't make abortion illegal. I mean, I keep trying to make this point ever since I learned it from Mary Lou that women have been self-aborting since the dawn of time and women have always had abortions and just considered it a form of birth control or, you know, like um, restarting menses or something like that. I may be getting the, the phrasing wrong there, um, you know, ending a pregnancy, what have you. Um, like it's not, you really, you really can't actually stop women from, from doing that. But also I feel like a main difference is that with surrogacy, it's somebody else doing something to a woman's body, whereas with abortion, it's her doing something to her own body. Uh, abortion is a medical procedure that women often need, and abortion can be life-saving. Um, it absolutely, not just when a pregnancy is threatening to the mother's life, but when a woman is with an abusive man, we know that the single leading cause of death of women of reproductive age is being killed by a man that she is currently having sex with or has had sex with in the past. So this is a way for a woman to get out of, out of a life-threatening situation on multiple levels. And again, um, surrogacy is never beneficial. Abortion is often Well, it's beneficial to the the gay yeah. men or to right. perhaps to the Kardashians. But never to the the pregnant woman or the baby. No. And I think we just have to keep coming back of like, okay, at what at what point in a pregnancy do these people who think abortion should be criminal think that a woman stops being a human being with rights and becomes a state regulated incubator? Like when when is that? Eight weeks, six weeks, thirty weeks? Like what at what point do I belong to the state and I'm forced to risk my life to be an unwilling life support system for another person? Yeah, I think that's a good question because often what the debate does come down to is weeks and people who are playing rational in this debate and trying to frame the Democrats as crazy, which is very easy to do, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> say that, you know, like, well, okay, sure, sure, it should be allowed in the, the first trimester, but not after that, certainly not in the third trimester. I mean, what do you think about babies being killed in the third prim trimester? And I mean, shouldn't, shouldn't we, we have laws about that? That makes total sense. And I would say no, because again, what I've, this is all things that I've learned from talking to Mary Lou over the years. Um, I mean, how many women do we know that are getting abortions? Like, up until they go to the hospital, like, or in the third trimester at all. I mean, I can't imagine that any woman would want to do that. And if she was doing that, it would be because there was something serious going on. But still, it's, I, I still feel like as long as it's, it's in her body, she gets to decide. And I know that people don't like the idea of it again, and it's not a perfect thing. It's it would be, I, I imagine in that situation in particular, it would be a pretty awful thing for the woman as well. Like, I don't think that's a, a desirable outcome for a woman, but you know, it, I just, I, I can't get past the, it's in her body. So it's a part of her body and she gets to say, and nobody else gets to say. Mm -hmm. Well, and also abortion is a medical procedure. Surrogacy is an industry. I mean, there's a huge, yeah. just a huge difference there. I right. think that some anti-abortion people would call abortion an industry, which I disagree with, again, because I think that women have been self-aborting since the dawn of time. But I think there's people that consider, you know, I don't know much about this, so unfortunately I can't speak to it, but think that, you know, Planned Parenthood 
has turned abortion into an industry in some way. But I think that most of what Planned Parenthood is doing right now is selling hormones to little kids who they're transing and, and rendering right. sterile. Right, right. Well, also, you just have you have a an exploitative medical industry in the first place. It's not only abortion that's been turned right. into an industry. I mean, the whole medical system in the United States especially yeah. is an industry. So then what um, would we say like cancer treatment is an industry? And mm -hmm. I mean, it's still a medical procedure regardless of the corruption within the system. So, right. And, you know, there is some truth in these critiques of um, Planned Parenthood making money selling aborted tissue. That's something we need to talk to uh, talk about as women that, again, I view that as we're being exploited, not that abortion is this evil industry. It's that Planned Parenthood has put all the feminist women's health co collectives that provided abortion out of business. They are the the big box store of, of reproductive health in the United States. They're the only place women can go for an abortion. And then they're exploiting us by selling the, the tissue that's being extracted from us against our will. The woman's not making any money from that. But this isn't just happening in abortion. Who are they it, selling it to? Research companies. There's a lot of money in researching fetal tissue. For um, what? A lot of it's for the fertility industry, for cancer industry, you know, looking at, um, you know, they, they, there are a lot of mad scientists out there too. I mean, sometimes they're just doing like, they just want to test stuff. Um, in the industrial birth model though, our body parts are being sold too. Like there's a, you know, most women don't bring their placenta home from the hospital and the, the hospitals are making tons of money selling our placentas, selling our amniotic membranes, selling one of the reasons they cut the cords so early when babies are born in the hospital is then the cord is really fat with this, this substance called Wharton's jelly. There's a whole industry of selling the Wharton's jelly, which if you let a baby get his or her own blood supply and don't cut the cord until the placenta is delivered, which is the normal human design, there's no Wharton's jelly to sell. So they, wait, you know, so, so what, what do they use that for? What they use the amniotic? I just got an ad for. Um, do I want to come to a continuing education session on using amniotic membranes to treat uh, post-op patients who've had eye surgery? So they put like the amniotic membrane over the eye. They're using amniotic membranes in um, burn treatment. They sell the stem cells in the cord blood. Um, there are a lot of like biohacker. Um, rejuvenation project products made out of out of placenta parts the, um, the 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 cosmetic industry uses placenta in hair products um i just got stem cells in my knee so i described so, it as getting placentas injected into my knee but that's not true they no i mean it's usually your own the, stem cells right it's no they take yeah. them out of a i think if they if you inject your own stem cells into you it's not really going to do much ah. um so they they take stem cells from placentas, right? I believe, and then they can sort of cure mm -hmm. injuries, essentially. Right. So the the cord blood, the blood that is circulating between the placenta and and the the baby, um, and that's still a living unit. For this is something that gets lost in industrial birth, but anyone who's been to an undisturbed birth knows that um, there's this liminal space where the mother and ba the baby's been born, but there's still a unit. The placenta is still pulsing, pulse blood into the baby. That blood is full of stem cells, which have profound anti-cancer properties, anti-aging properties, yeah. immune system properties. So the babies are being robbed of that. And we don't know what the long-term effects of that are, but we do know our kids aren't doing well, right? I mean, we know our kids are not doing well. Um, and then it's being sold for all kinds of industries. Um, <clears throat> okay. I think we should log off soon. We've been here for an hour and a half. If anybody has some last minute questions, use the super chat. Otherwise, hold your peace. Um, I mean, yeah, I think these conversations are massive, obviously. And like so much interconnected now with transhumanism and biohacking, which are mm -hmm. things that are industries that are really totally led by men, these like tech guys who just, I think, see it as a, a way to improve or perfect humanity and the humans, the kids, the women are, are left out of this. Um, 
it's i mean it's it's all like that it's the same thing with prostitution right it's like what about the men who aren't getting laid what about the men who can't have babies like what about what these men want it's like what about women's bodies and lives and humanity and you know like what about the 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 harmful impacts of all of this on society in general like so that you can be this perfect being or whatever you imagine a perfect being to me that seems hor horrible and horrifying. Like <clears throat> the world these men are imagining seems so dystopian. And, and I just, uh, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm horrified that people have such opposing views on what uh, the, the utopia should look like. <laughs> but anyway, okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We'll be back next Wednesday at the same time. Um, again, you can find Jen's work at Redux and you can find her on Twitter at Women Read Women. I don't know if there's anything else you want to promote while we're here. Um, not especially just to say that we really depend on donations from supporters for Redux. And so we work really hard and we really appreciate the support. And if you do support through Patreon, you can get stickers and things like that. Okay, awesome. Um, and yeah, it's redux.info. Um, and they have a great Twitter account too. Um, and Mary Lou, of course, you can find her on Substack at Mary Lou Singleton. You can find her on Twitter at ML underscore Singleton. You can find her website at www.enchantedfamilymedicine.com. How I Healed is howihealed.substack.com. And of course, this is my YouTube channel. So I hope that you will subscribe um, and, and like the video and I wanted to remind everybody not to drink the Kool-Aid and that you can buy this don't drink the Kool-Aid t-shirt at Teespring which I've linked to below in the show notes also on YouTube um I'm probably forgetting stuff I forget stuff every time but thanks yeah thanks everyone I'm about to sneeze so we really need to get <laughs> out of here <laughs> and Emma's whining you can hear a little Emma whining for something that I'll figure out shortly <laughs> she needs a hug or treats or she has to pee or something um <clears throat> so yeah and thanks thanks so much for joining us jen this this early in the day we really appreciate yeah. it and thank you for the work you do it's so important genevieve i admire you so much please don't <laughs> <laughs> i'm so grateful for your work Thanks. Yeah. yeah, I feel the same way. And I feel the same way about Mary Lou, of course, because everything that I've said in this stream, I've learned from her. So thanks. <laughs> all, all of my ideas are actually Mary Lou's ideas. <laughs> it's not really true, but thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. And thanks again, everyone for tuning in and, and tune in again next week. And have a great